xb0, xb1, yb0, yb1. And if you do that, you get traces that go the other way. You get ellipses in the opposite directions, right? So it's, that looks like a pain in the ass, doesn't it? Right? Start z0, draw an ellipse. All these ellipses. Now let x be 0, ellipse, ellipse. You put them all together, you get an ellipsoid. Yes? So what determines the frequency of the tra uh, traces? Ha however you want. You could do like z equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or you could do them like every 5, or you could do them. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, like smaller and smaller. Yeah, how, whatever you need to draw it, right, is what you need to do. You would run into a problem at some point, like, see here that it looks like the biggest z could be would be 10? Yeah. Okay, let's see what would happen if we go beyond 10 here. So if I, uh, well, this isn't the equation, so I can't use this, but let's just use this. When would we have a problem? If this number ever got bigger than what? One. one right? Because if this got bigger than one, what would happen? I subtract it, this would become a negative on this side. And it would be impossible to take two things and square them and add and get a negative. So you'd be outside of, you wouldn't be able to get a solution. Does that answer your question? Okay. See, but we don't do traces, right? What we do is we go to GeoGebra and we type in, right? So it's, we don't have to worry about all this. Okay, so that's an ellipsoid. Next one, an elliptic paraboloid. So we call an ellipsoid an ellipsoid. The reason we call it an ellipsoid is because all traces are ellipses. So if you trace it this way, you get ellipses. You trace it this way, you get ellipses. Trace it this way. In all directions, you get ellipses. This next one is called an elliptic paraboloid. And that means your traces are both ellipses and parabolas. So if you cut it one way, you're going to get ellipses. Cut it other ways, you're going to get parabolas. Now let's just look at it. Looks like a bowl, right? Like a bowl. What's the equation of this bowl? Here's how thing, th things start to get complicated here. Because look at this. Look at this equation. Do you see all three variables? Yeah. Okay, all three variables are there. All right, are all three of them squared? No, only two of the three are squared, right? The other variable's not squared, and it's on the other side of the equation. These two things are being added together, right? So when we have that, we will get a bowl that opens in, in what direction? In what direction is this bowl opening? Through what axis? Like the z, right? The z-axis. And do you see that z is the variable that's isolated here? That tells you the direction that your bowl opens. This whole thing together tells you you have a bowl. All right? Let me show you another one. Oh, OK. There, I was going to try not show you the formula. but. Do you all agree that that's the same sort of thing we just had? It's a bowl. What axis is it going out? The y. the y, right? So this should be, I should see what two variables on the left side, both squared? X and z, they should both be squared and divided by numbers, and there's a plus between them. And we see a y on the other side? That's, so these can yeah. only ever go in the direction of the positive axis, right? Because you're adding the squares? That's right. That's right, your bowl would never go the other way because this could never be negative, right? Do we have any other bowls possible? Come out at us, right? The x-axis? We could have that, right? In this case, we would have, we should expect to see the y and the z variable squared being added together. And then the other side, we should see the x. Okay? There's only 18 more. You ready to keep going? Next one, hyperbolic paraboloids. The traces are hyperbolas and parabolas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they call this a saddle. Is we're going to study this is this going to be referred to as a saddle point in the middle. I don't remember, can I turn the traces off? I don't think I can turn the traces off. Oh well. It is what it is. Okay, so what does this equation look like? Whoa, okay, that's almost what we just had. Except, we have a minus. So now it is possible to get negative, which is why this thing, it's, this thing is like a, a, a sheet of paper that's folded up this direction, 
but simultaneously that sheet of paper is folded down in the other direction. You have to imagine this paper is like, like a, what's the word I'm looking for? It allows you to manipulate it, stretch it. Malleable. Malleable. It's kind of like, you know, you can, it's not going to tear, right? So you just kind of fold, fold up here and then fold the other edges down. Huh. Is uh, well, if you look at it from the other yeah. side. Yeah. Okay. So look, they call this a hyperbolic paraboloid because when you look at it from the top, the traces are hyperbolas. And when you look at it from the, where? I need other traces. Here, if I do traces from another direction, I get parabolas. You see all those parabolas? So, um, what else do I want to point out? That what it's all going to come down to, uh, down to for us is this. Can we look at this, can we look at an equation to determine what it is? Like, we don't need to know exactly what it looks like, but we need to know, okay, this is a hyperbolic paraboloid, right? That's what we need to kind of be able to determine. All right, I'm going to, yep. Uh, are they like going out forever or is that just... No, like it's going out forever. Okay. This paper folds up and just keeps going. Yeah. Um, one thing you could think about here is what if x was zero? What if x is zero? What is this? Parabolas, right? Those are parabolas that open down because you have a negative in front. If y is zero, now you have a parabolas that open up. Which is why here, if we look from here, look, we're looking down the x-axis right now, straight into the x-axis, which means we're looking at x is zero. If we look at x is zero, all our parabolas open down, right? If we come in and we let y be zero, I need my traces the other way. Uh, x there we go. We come in this way, look this way, see our traces are what? Parabolas that open up. So. Okay, we're going to keep going. Um, of course, you could change this around, right? We could have a Y here, and we could have X and Z here. And it's just going to change, like, kind of the direction it opens. Okay, next one. Ready? What's it called? Cone. Oh, a cone. See, that's a simple one, right? Cones. That's a cone. What's the equation of a cone? All three variables are here, right? All three variables are squared, but do you see they're not all on the same side equal to one, like uh, the ellipsoid? It's not this, right? It's not this. It's one of the variables is isolated, it's squared. It's, this is a positive term here. This right here gives us a cone. Would you say that that cone opens uh, down the x, y, or z axis? Z, right? The cone kind of goes down the z-axis, and that's the variable that's isolated here on the right by itself. Yeah, so you could have a cone go the other way, right? You could have that. Which, uh, which variable is isolated there? The y. the y, right? So you're going to have this. And then x, right? Isolate the x, it'll come down the x-axis. Okay, so again, it's all about, you know, how many variables do you see, what's the combination, how many of them are squared, you know, is there pluses between them, is there minuses? And I don't expect you to memorize all this. Just know the book has all this information, my notes have it. Next one is called the hyperboloid of one sheet. I think there's two more, this one and one more, all right? So the hyperboloid of one sheet. It looks like, to me, it looks like those uh, nuclear w water cooling towers, kind of. Have you seen those before? Um, that is a hyperboloid of one sheet. Interesting shape. Let's see what the equation looks like. It's almost the ellipsoid. Almost, right? Except that's a minus, right? That's a minus right in front of the z squared. All three variables are there, all three are squared. See, it equals one, so it's almost the ellipsoid. And if we do that, would you all say that that shape is going, uh, opening up the z-axis, x-axis, y-axis? 
Z, right? Can we all agree it's kind of going through the Z? And that is the only variable that has the minus in front of it, right? So we should expect that there are two more of these, right? So that's that one. We should expect the negative to be in front of the Y, right? Oh, there it is right there. Notice I changed it and put it behind. And then last one. Okay, how are we doing? 20 minutes. Last one, hyperboloid of two sheets. So what happens here with the hyperboloid of two sheets is imagine taking this and like squeezing it in the middle until you actually break it and it breaks into two different surfaces. And that's where we get the hyperboloid of two sheets. It's like you squeeze the center out and then just rips off the two ends. That definitely looks like there's a way to orient it, right? Like this is like the Z, and go up Z, down Z. Okay, let's see the equation. What do you think, equation? Think all three variables squared? Hmm? So what is it? Two of the variables are negative, one of them is positive. Instead, the other way, right? It was two positive, one negative. Now it's Two negatives, one positive, and uh, the one the axis it goes, I guess down, is going to be the one that has the positive on it. Then we have, of course, two more cases, right? That one and that one. All right, that's it. We're at the end of this, but now we need to be able to do something with it. So let's do example six. Uh, well. Let's do, let's do example four first. Whoa, what happened? Can you say to assume that like with circles and stuff, if you have your variables in parentheses with a number or shifting it? Like if you have like X Yes, okay. yes, very good question. The question was if, you know, like if we write down X squared plus Y squared equals nine, right? We, we hopefully all understand that that's coming from this generic equation for a circle where HK is the center of that circle. And in this case, the center would be what? Zero, zero, right? Because it's X minus zero squared, Y minus zero squared. However, if I wrote X minus one squared plus Y plus four squared equals nine, these are both circles with radius three, this one's centered at the origin, and this one is centered where? At one negative four. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We can shift all you can assume that for all of the things we just looked at, yeah. if we see something in parentheses, we're going to have x, y's, and z's though, right? Yeah. If you see like x minus one, y plus four, z minus seven, then it's going to be whatever that shape was, but centered at that new point. And that's what this is asking. It says, hey, look, we're given this equation, right? We're given this equation. We want to reduce it into its standard form. So which of the surfaces we looked at just now is that? Um, so classify the surface. Tell me like which way it opens and tell me if it's uh, got a, you know, what its center is, if it has a center. All right, let's write it down. X squared equals x squared equals 2y squared, whoa, this is a weird marker, plus 3z squared, it's done. It's good. It's good. How bad, I mean, the last few semesters have been so bad. Like, I'm, I'm blowing my mind with how accurate I've been this semester. All right. Well, I start to run through different possibilities here, right? Um, all three variables, right, are here. All three variables are here. All of them are squared. So if I scroll through my notes, let's just go through a process of elimination. Could it be, could it be this one? Are all three variables squared here? Yes, okay, it could be that. Could be that. Could be that. I don't know yet. I'm going through this just to eliminate first. What could it not be? Let's see. Could it be, could it be, uh, no, keep going. Couldn't be this, right? Because this doesn't have all three variables squared. 
So you see I'm just kind of eliminating some things. Anything that, anything that doesn't have all three variables squared wouldn't work. Okay, so I would, you know, right now I just kind of know a little bit that all three variables have to be squared. Um, what else? How about, let's try and um, rewrite it so that these are divided by some numbers. That's kind of tricky, but yeah, that is true. I have x squared divided by 1, y squared divided by a half is the same as 2y squared, and then I have z squared divided by 1 third is the same as 3z squared. See, I kind of remember we did one where we had two variables on one side, squared and added together equals the variable squared on the other side, and they had numbers underneath them. So let me, let me scroll back up and see if we can find that. It's not this one, right? I need all to be positive, all to be positive. How about that? Why is it not this? It, could, I, could I move this over and make it negative? Yes, but what would be the problem? It would be equal zero, and that equation requires it to be one. So I can't use that. Oh, oh, oh. That's it. That's it right there, isn't it? That's it. Now, I need the bottoms to be squareds, right? So how could I write that? Let me, let me do this. I'm going to do, I'm going to write just like this. y squared over what? How do I write one half as something squared? How about the square root of a half squared? Right? Isn't that what one half is? One half is the square root of one half squared. Plus z over, do the same exact thing, what? The square root of one third squared, and then equals x squared over, well, one is one squared. All I really care about with this is, do you know what axis this goes down? X, and do you know what it is? It's a cone, right? It's a cone. That's all I would care about. That this is a cone, and that it goes down the x-axis. Can I go to the next problem? Sure. Okay, let's try this one. Right away, I'm seeing that I have all three variables, but I'm seeing also that only two of the three are squared, right? Only two of the three are squared. So let's get the 4x by itself, and let's make this y squared minus 3z squared, like that. So I just left this over here and moved those two to the other side. And somewhere in the notes, I remember we had something like this, right? So go up. Let me go to the very top of this. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't the, the cylinder or the parabolic cylinder. Hyperbolic. Let me see. Not that one. Right there. No. Is this going to work? No. Elliptic paraboloid. Why is it not this? Plus, right? And we have minus between these. So it's going to be the next one after this one. Right there. And we have x by itself. So let me scroll down to the one that had x by itself. It's that one right there. We have x by itself equals, we've got y and z on the other side, minus between. So this is it right here. So this is a hyperbolic paraboloid. Right? Let's make it look like this. So I'd write x over what? One fourth. One fourth. And I don't need the square root there. Equals y squared over what? One squared? Minus z squared over one third on the bottom, right? 
but then you have to do the square root of one third squared. I'm just trying to get it to match this formula just so you see exactly what A, B, C is. So here A would, uh, A would be one, B would be the square root of one third, and C would be one fourth. All right, last example. And this one is more like what I'm talking about. I like, I like this problem. Mm. So same sort of idea here. Can you figure out what that is? What type of surface it is? Do you remember seeing one that had all three variables in it with squareds and things not squared? No. Right? I didn't give you one like that. Maybe it's a sphere? Why don't, yeah, why don't we complete the square? Why don't we do this? Okay, that's just me rearranging things. I'm getting all my X's together, all my Y's together, all my Z's together. We talked about completing the square in here, right? We talked about the hidden zero, right? Okay, to complete the square on this first two, yeah, I'm gonna take half of that number, which is negative one, right? And I square it, which is one, and I add it and subtract it. So I'm gonna do x squared minus two x plus one minus one. Well, let's do a different color. Plus one minus one. That's my hidden zero. Now, this part, be careful. You cannot complete the square on this yet. Why? You have to have, an, you have, to have a positive one as your coefficient out here. So what I'm gonna do is this. I'm gonna pull negative one out. I don't need to put one, but I'm going to. And then rewrite that like this. I'm only pulling a negative one out on these two terms. And then the rest of it, just let me rewrite it. You have to do that step. You cannot complete the square if your coefficient is not one. So now I'm gonna complete the square on this. So this is x squared minus two x. I had the plus one minus one here. And then I have the minus one. And then in this parentheses, y squared minus two y. I take half of, half of this number, which is negative one. I add it and subtract it right there. And then plus z squared plus four z. I'm gonna complete the square on this, so half of four is two. I square that, I get four, I add and subtract four. And then I still had the plus two. Does anyone have a question on that, completing the square part? You sure? What do these first three terms turn into? X minus one squared. X minus one squared. Then I start minus one. Minus one times, okay, this right here becomes the first three terms become y minus one squared. But then I have minus one. That's all still inside this parenthesis. And that negative one has to be distributed through still. Over here we get plus these three terms. Give me z plus two, quantity squared. And then I still have minus four minus two, which is minus two, or sorry, minus four plus two, which is minus two. We're almost there. This is x minus one squared. Let me get all my constants out of here. This, oh no, I'll do it in a second. Minus one. Distributing through here, we get minus y minus one squared plus one. You just have to be careful there, because when you go here to here, all that happens is it throws a negative in front. And then when you go from here to here, you get the plus one. And then plus z plus two squared minus two equals zero. And I think now we can get all our constants together. Just minus two, right? 
because these ones are gone. So we'll have this. We'll have x minus 1 squared minus y minus 1 squared plus z plus 2 squared. And this is minus 2, right? <clears throat> I'm going to move it to the other side as, pop, as equals 2. So this tells me that I do have a quadratic surface, but it's been moved, like the center of it has been moved. My center is 1, 1, negative 2. But what type of quadratic surface is it? So what surface do we have that had all three variables squared, right? We had a, a, a plus on two of the variables, a minus on the other, and here it equals 2, so I don't, what the hell are we going to do? Do, divide everything by 2 to get a 1 on the other side? We can try that. Yeah, let's divide by 2 and get a 1 on the other side. So we'll get x minus 1 squared over 2 minus the y minus 1 squared over 2 plus the z plus 2 squared over 2 equals 1. And I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to find something that fits like that, right? We need all three variables squared. We need all three of them on the one, same side equal one, and one of the two variables is negative. So this is the one right before this one. This is this one. And we have the negative on the y, so that would be right there. That one right there. Do you all agree with me? We got our x, our x's are squared, plus our z's, and then we have minus the y's, equal 1. So this is a hyperboloid one sheet. All right, <clears throat> now look at your take home exam. Look at number three. Find the shortest distance, that's what we started class with, right? Find the shortest distance from the center of this quadratic surface, which should be a point, right? To the line of intersection of these two planes. I hope that problem makes a little more sense now. Okay. What's the center of this quadratic surface? One, one, negative two. One, one, negative two. One, one, negative two is the center of that quadratic surface. So that's just a point, right? One, one, negative two. All right. I say we wrap it up. I don't have time to start. With. It's the end of the section. Um, we will come back and what are we going to do next? Y'all can start packing up. What are we doing next? I feel like we're about to get into it for real soon. <laughs> yeah, we're still in chapter 10, so we're going to do vector functions and space curves. So we're actually going to start talking about derivatives. We're going to do some derivatives, and we'll do some arc length and curvature, and then we get in chapter 11. This is where we get more into derivatives, partial derivatives, tangent, chain rule, Maxman, Lagrange. Y'all are going to love Lagrange. <laughs> and then we have our first exam, midterm, right? And then once we get past the midterm, then we start doing antiderivatives. So pretty much everything up to exam one is going to be Cal 1 in three-dimensional space. That's what we're going to be doing. And then when we get past exam one, the rest of the semester is going to be doing Cal 2 stuff in three-dimensional space until we get to vector fields, chapter 13. And then it's, yeah, I'll talk to you when we get there. That's not, yeah. We, that's basically all the calculus that we have done, but now in, we got to bring vectors and vector fields into it. And 
Vector, vector calculus is basically what it is. All right, everyone, have a good weekend. Your mini exams due when? Monday. Monday. When Monday? Beginning of class. So I, I won't accept it late because it's not fair to your classmates to take it after. All right, so please, if you're not going to be here, sit, text me a picture of it, something. Don't, just don't not show up with it. All right, get it to me somehow before the time hits. Have a great uh, weekend, everyone. Promise I won't ever have a class like that where we're lights off. This is it. This is about as sleepy as it gets.